Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Senior Director of Programs at Jewish Funders Network. And on behalf of JFN, I'm happy to welcome you to today's webinar, Israel's Selfie, the 2021 Israeli Democratic Index. Today, we are joined by Yochanan Plesner, President of the Israel Democracy Institute, and Professor Tamar Herman, Director of the Viterbi um, Family Center for Public Opinion and Policy Research, who will discuss the exclusive data in the 2021 Israeli Dem Democracy Index presented to President Herzog earlier this month. month. Published annually since 2003, the index provides an in-depth assessment of Israeli democracy based on a comprehensive survey of public opinion. The index an analysis of survey findings create a database for informed decision-making among policymakers seeking to strengthen Israeli democracy and preserve the country's unique Jewish character. And now I will hand it over to today's moderator, Dr. Jesse Ferris, Vice President of Strategy at Israel Democracy Institute. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Tamar, and thank you to JFN, and welcome to all our uh, viewers today. So uh, as Tamar mentioned, the starting point for our conversation today is a survey of Israeli public opinion conducted in uh, late 2021 and submitted to President Herzog two weeks ago. Um, the Democracy Index, I should say, can be downloaded for free from our website. Uh, it's also available in English, and there is a highlights document for those of you who don't feel like wading through all 220 pages. Um, in terms of the format, I'll engage Tamal and Yohanan in a conversation for the first 30 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up to questions from you all. So feel free to text in questions as we speak. Um, you can also write to us after the fact, and we promise to uh, respond. Um, one note, we're gonna try something out that we haven't done in the previous webinars. Um, we're gonna try a, a poll of participants and try to match your answers up with uh, Israeli public opinion. So one of the questions we'll get to later on in this session has to do with the major rifts within Israeli society. Uh, so to make things interesting, Tamar will be putting up a poll in a few seconds, asking you to vote on what you think is the most significant division within Israeli society today. Uh, so please take part in that, and later on we'll uh, match your answers with those given by the people of Israel. Uh, but let me let me begin with the issue that. Uh, most concerned President Herzog, which is the alarming decline in the public's trust in some of the major institutions of Israeli democracy. Um, of course, this is a problem throughout the democratic world, it's a problem here in the US, but it seems particularly severe uh, and possibly dangerous in Israel. So, Bar, let's start with that, and maybe you can give us a snapshot of where we stand in terms of public trust in, in, in the key institutions. So uh, every year, actually, we measure uh, the trust of the public in, uh, in eight institutions, the IDF, the president of the state, the Supreme Court, the police, the media, the government, the Knesset, and the political parties. And uh, usually, actually, in every measurement that we had, we have the IDF on top. Still, uh, although they are happy to be on top, they are not so happy because uh, there was a significant decline in the uh, trust uh, of the public in the IDF. And uh, for the first time ever, it got below 80%. Uh, it's 78% in our latest measurement. Uh, but uh, the, the, the Problem here is not the very fact that it is going down, but the fact, as you'll see in a minute, I'll show you that the distrust uh, of uh, uh, certain segments within the public is uh, getting uh, more visible than it used to be in the past. And then we have the president of the state of Israel, and you can see always the difference between uh, the Jews and the Arabs. The Supreme Court is uh, getting very low. It's uh, below 50%, uh, and I'll talk uh, a bit more about it uh, later on. The police is getting down, and actually uh, we have a new um, figure that we uh, actually got this morning, and it got uh, from 
23.5% amongst the Jews to 23.5% uh, as of yesterday and the day before yesterday. Amongst the Arabs, it's about the same. The media is about the same as it was last year. Government went down a bit, Knesset went down a bit, and the political parties uh, are so low that we see the floor effect. In general, what I can tell you is that compared to 2020, in 2021, we were in uh, a worse place uh, in terms of the public um, trust in all institutions, uh, in fact. And this is uh, an indication of the mood of the people more than of the functioning of those institutions in uh, the last uh, uh, year or so. What I'm trying to, to say here is that the Israeli public in a way is turning its back to the political institution first and foremost, but also to other institutions. And the uh, issue with the Supreme Court is particularly dangerous as far as we are uh, concerned about the Israeli democratic regime because it seems that the Supreme Court has become uh, an institution that is being supported mainly by the center and the left, whereas the right is uh, uh, in in a way out of the game vis-a-vis -vis this, this Supreme Court. So, so Tamara, let's, let's take a short stop there. I want to dive in a little bit more deeply, both on the Supreme Court and on the, on the idea. Uh, Yohanan, this, I mean, it's a pretty bleak picture. We didn't, you know, we didn't include slides of year over year, but there, there's a decline, I think, in all uh, institutions. How do you explain, I, obviously it's been a rough year, but how do you explain this, the drop across the board? And then we'll talk a little bit more specifically about the Supreme Court. Well, so uh, thanks, Jesse, and thank you, Tamar, and, and thanks uh, uh, to the friends and uh, participants that joined us in this conversation. Um, well, what we're seeing now is particularly uh, interesting and also disconcerting because we've been measuring uh, public opinion and the public trust vis-a-vis -vis Israel's governing institutions, as Tamar mentioned, for almost 20 years. Actually, next year will be the 20th year. And what we've seen over the past decade is a decline of trust in the uh, institutions that were operating our political, the democratically elected political institutions, i.e. Knesset, political parties, government, and media. Those four institutions that are basically the institutions that uh, uh, operate our, uh, uh, our democracy that are directly in interaction with the Israeli people, and, and those institutions that uh, fiddled in the mess of politics or interacted with it, uh, uh, got the heat. The new uh, feature that is being published now, and is, as, as I mentioned, we find it disconcerting, is the fact that even the <clears throat> institutions that were perceived as professional institutions that were one step removed from, from politics, like the IDF, almost um, 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 uh, a consensus institution in Israeli society, especially because of the existential threat, and the Supreme Court that, that enjoyed less support, but uh, traditionally had very high support, both uh, demonstrated a sharp decline. Um, the, the Supreme Court, the 41% figure within the Jewish population, is the first time that there's a minority of, uh, of Israelis that uh, have trust in the Supreme Court. Just as a matter of comparison, almost 20 years ago when we started measuring, it was almost as high as 80% trust. And, 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 uh, and over time and a gradual decline. And this year there was another uh, uh, um, uh, 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 steep decline. Now, um, what are the reasons? Uh, with respect to the judiciary, uh, there are the general reasons that have to do with the rise of populism and the crisis of trust in professional institutions and in the establishments throughout the democratic world. We see it in other liberal democracies. Obviously, I'm not an expert to the US case, but uh, those of us who are uh, uh, or uh, uh, would probably not find it uh, uh, completely foreign, uh, this uh, crisis of uh, trust. Um, so there's one explanation is, is the general uh, trend that is now hitting not only the political institutions, 
but also the professional institutions. But other explanations have to do with Israel's unique character and, and set of circumstances. And what do I mean by that? We are now at the end, perhaps at the end, hopefully at the end, not for sure, of a, a very long, Israel's longest political slash constitutional crisis in the country's history. It constituted in 2019 until uh, the beginning of 2021, four consecutive election campaigns, uh, indecisive election campaigns, uh, uh, a, a, a government that was at a complete deadlock in decision making, a uh, 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 political uh, discussion that uh, reached uh, new highs in terms of uh, hate speech uh, uh, from both sides. So this one, this is one of the results of that uh, of that crisis. The result meant that uh, especially young people pulled, checked out, feel more alienated uh, uh, from. Uh, 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 from the public sphere, from the political process. And, um, and of course, uh, the, the, it wasn't just a crisis and uh, it also took part alongside with a, a COVID uh, uh, crisis, but it was also a crisis that uh, was directly linked to the judiciary because the key issue was Mr. Netanyahu, Mr. Netanyahu's, uh, uh, Mr. Netanyahu being indicted and, and Having to uh, uh, fight for his uh, uh, prove his case in, in in the courtroom, and therefore Netanyahu was who was a was probably the the most effective communicator in 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 in, in, in our in the in the past generation in Israeli public life used his uh, his uh, communication skills in order to undermine the trust in in in, in the judiciary. And apparently, if we look at the results, uh, uh, he did a, a rather good job. But there's also Objective uh, reasons that have nothing to do with Mr. Netanyahu about, and 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 it's uh, and we examine them in depth uh, in a chapter that is uh, uh, devoted to the subject of trust in the uh, judiciary, extended the uh, processes uh, of uh, seeking justice and uh, a clogged system and so on. So there, so there are some objective reasons. Obviously, the, uh, there's the reason of Mr. Netanyahu and his campaign, and therefore we see also a sharp decline in trust among uh, 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 Israelis who self-identify themselves as right-wing. And, and we also, um, uh, uh, and it's also a continuation of a trend that we've seen over the past 20 years uh, that the court, as it sits on, on questions, uh, as it discusses uh, cases, uh, constitutional cases, uh, and, and obviously it's a court in a liberal democracy in a country without a constitution, but, but obviously is committed to principles like equality, uh, uh, is uh, consistently uh, uh, being criticized uh, uh, by some uh, religious elements uh, uh, that find its, uh, its uh, rulings uh, uh, unsatisfactory. So there, it's a combination of, of factors uh, uh, that led to that. With the IDF, it's a, it's a so, it's well, let's, somewhat let's different. Let's pause for a second, Yohan, before we go to the IDF. Let's stop on the Supreme Court. Tomorrow, you have some, can you show us some data about the decline of trust in the Supreme Court over time? And also, Yohan referenced this division along sort of political ideological affiliation in terms of levels of trust in the court. Um, we just sure. need to share that. I'll try to, to show it. Um, and uh, this is uh, the trend. <clears throat> This is the trend in general, and you can see that there is a constant decline uh, by uh, the overall population uh, in Israel. But these are Jews and Arabs. Uh, um, in this specific measurement, the Jewish sample was lower in terms of trust compared to the Arabs interviewees, which is interesting, but you can see that it changes quite uh, uh, rapidly between one measurement to another. But if you look at uh, uh, the level of religiosity here, oh, that's dramatic. Say, why did I say, why did I say that uh, uh, certain segments are in fact out of the game? Because uh, for example, amongst the ultra Orthodox, 1% expressed trust uh, in the uh, Supreme Court. Now, this is a dramatic figure with far-reaching consequences, Tamar, right? Absolutely. It was 7% last year, and we thought that uh, we hit bottom rock. But uh, apparently, uh, we now we are at the, at the very floor uh, 
uh, in terms of, of the trust of, of a significant sector of the Israeli Jewish public and Israeli public in general, only one quarter among the uh, uh, religious or the orthodox uh, respondents. And then we have uh, uh, two groups of the uh, traditionalists, the uh, more religious and the less religious. And even amongst the secular, it's a bit over uh, a half, which is significant because it used to be in the 90s, uh, in, in, in the past. And, and uh, uh, one uh, of our team members uh, at the IDI actually analyzed the data and he showed that whereas the Supreme Court is not gaining support on the right side of the political spectrum where the ultra-Orthodox and the Orthodox are, uh, they are also losing uh, uh, the foothold amongst those on the center and left of center because they feel that in uh, recent years, uh, the Supreme Court has become too compliant with the, uh, the government or is not getting head on with the government on significant issues like the nation state law and, 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 and other issues. So uh, they are not gaining on, on, on the very low side, but they are losing on the higher side. And I think- Tamar, there's a question from the audience. Could you clarify the differentiation between traditional religious and traditional non-religious categories? How, how, do, how are those break down? That's, uh, 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 this division is, uh, uh, we, we are following here the uh, Israeli Central Statistics Bureau because uh, uh, for years we know that these uh, two groups, uh, which are about 35, 33, 35% of the Israeli Jewish population, they are very different from each other on certain issues. Here they are almost the same, but uh, on uh, issues like uh, Shabbat uh, or uh, public transportation in Shabbat um, and, and state and religion, the non-religious uh, traditionalists are more similar to the secular, whereas the uh, Religious traditionalists are very close to the orthodox. Tamar, I think also um, a clarification would uh, be a fruitful for how would you translate traditional from Hebrew to the American uh, version of tradition, which is Masorti. And uh, right, it's so it's not the same. Yeah. yeah. That's why I, I didn't translate it because. Uh, it's the Israeli the version of Masorti and not the. American Israeli version of Masorti, yeah. but that's perhaps for a different discussion. The, the Ohana, but I, I, I want to pivot to you for a second. So uh, these are a very troubling uh, statistics about the Supreme Court for the first time dip, dipping below the 50% mark in terms of um, public trust. And I, I know this, the US Supreme Court is in the spotlight these days as well, but I mean, you got to bear in mind in Israel, no constitution, no bill of rights, no federal distribution of power. Uh, really the court, imperfect though it may be, is the principal guarantee guarantor of our most basic uh, rights. So um, can anything be done to reverse the situation? Yeah, Jesse, I, th I think it's a great point because again, the unique aspect of, of, of the Israeli democratic regime um, um, uh, dictates or, or leaves a very important role in, uh, for the Supreme Court Israel is a, is a functioning democracy that we're very proud of, but without a constitution, without any other, as you mentioned, institutions that constrain the otherwise absolute power of a political majority. And therefore the court is the only institution that can ensure that the government, the ministers, government, a, a public agencies a, a comply with the law, exercise their authority within the boundaries of the law, and obviously protect uh, 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 basic rights like uh, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, the, uh, uh, the, the fact that we have elections, it's basically the guarantor of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, of last resort and first resort of our democracy. Therefore, the Supreme Court in the Israeli unique case is particularly important and that's why it's uh, uh, particularly disturbing that the levels of trust are so low. One of um, the remedies 
and it's on the table now, and it's a very, very central uh, uh, issue that we're dealing with, and, and it's on our uh, agenda, is to legislate what we call a basic law um, for legislation. A basic law for legislation is, uh, is the technical wording for a, a, a constitutional chapter that will define the relationship and, and the boundaries between the legislature, the executive branch, and, and, and the judiciary. It will define how a, a basic laws, which are our equivalent of a constitution, how are they leg legislated, will create us a unique procedure for, le for legislating basic laws, i.e. higher uh, majority, a, a more extended process, and will define uh, 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 the conditions and the way in which the, the court can uh, uh, um, conduct judicial review over the Knesset's regular legislation. So well, basically, the idea is, without becoming too technical, is that what's on the table, and there's a committee uh, uh, with the, uh, a public committee set up by the justice minister that is trying to reach a compromise on, uh, on such a legislation, should it succeed, and we're working hard, and actually we have uh, representatives in this committee, and we're working with them to try and help them uh, find a compromise, should it succeed, hopefully uh, we will manage to stabilize the relationship between those very important branches of government and to some extent, depoliticize this issue, remove it from the day-to-day uh, -day war of a uh, political war of attrition that is so costly in terms of the uh, public trust. I want to shift to. If I may to the, add uh, yeah. uh, one uh, slide in order to show yeah. that, uh, in a way, um, we are. Uh, uh, on, on a solid ground vis-a-vis -vis the public here, uh, because as you can see, uh, when we ask the Supreme Court should have the power to overturn laws passed by the Knesset if they conflict with democratic principles. And here we see uh, that there is a, a majority uh, amongst uh, Jews and amongst Arabs, uh, and it didn't change uh, even uh, other things changed recently. So uh, we are uh, quite uh, satisfied with the fact that we didn't see any erosion on uh, uh, this issue. And even the president of the Supreme Court was very uh, uh, happy, quote unquote, uh, uh, that this was uh, this year's result because on the background of the uh, very sharp criticism against the Supreme Court. Uh, they were uh, quite uh, uh, fearful that this uh, uh, support for uh, some kind of an intervention of the Supreme Court in the state affairs would also deteriorate. And uh, indeed, they had the very uh, uh, good reason to be concerned because when we ask a question about uh, does the Supreme Court intervene too much in the decisions made by the government? You can see the blues here that there is a majority saying, yes, they intervene too much. And therefore, if we go back to that slide, to the former slide, the fact that they are being in a way allowed, so to speak, by the, gov by, by the public to interfere in such situation is uh, a bit of hope in a way. Yes, so, and, uh, just just to clarify, just, uh, you know, the, both the, President Hill, the, the Speaker of the Knesset, and others are very, very committed to passing such a legislation that will regulate the rules of the game and stabilize our, yeah, our the whole, regime. The whole question that, that both the Mama and Yochan are referencing of, of the, the proper relationship between the Supreme Court and the legislature and, and the executive branch is, is something that's been very much at the center of public debate over the past. Uh, year or two, and it's very interesting to see that there is uh, this residual level of public support for some form of a, a, a judicial review. Um, shifting to the IDF, because I, I know the decline in, in trust in the IDF was, was less significant than in the court, and perhaps less alarming, but nevertheless, the IDF uh, was, was not happy with these results, you know, and, and for good reason. And, and at a more fundamental level, you talk about the People's Army, this is the army of Ben-Gurion that won the 48 war in 56 and 67 and 73. It's, 
you know, if, if you lose the people, the people's trust, um, uh, what does national defense look like? So I mean, the, the stakes are pretty high here. Um, Mark, can you give us a, a little bit of a uh, broader sense of what's what's going on here? Because I know the trust in some areas has remained strong, and others it's weakened. And then Yohanan also give us your perspective on the IDF question and what can be done about it. Sure, Jesse. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, uh, actually a, 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 a line that represents the levels of trust in the IDF in the past. And actually, here uh, we, we can see the beginning of uh, some, some decline. Uh, Indeed, uh, there is the 90% measurement here, but the 90% uh, measurement was taken about a week after the, uh, how do you say it in English, guardian of the wars? What was the name of this? Uh, the, the last round of uh, violence with Hamas and Gaza. Okay. So people were still hopeful that this would change the balance of power between uh, uh, the authority, Palestinian authorities in Gaza and Israel, but apparently it didn't last long. And we can see the 82%, 81%, 81.5, 78. And we had some extra measurements here, which I didn't put in the graph. And they were all 81, uh, 80 and a half, and so on and so forth. So actually, this is the new plateau for, for the army. The 80% give and take, 1% here and 1%. Which, which Tamal, just to clarify from your graph, the last time we saw that was really in the aftermath of the Lebanon war in uh, around 2008. Absolutely, absolutely. The 78, the former 78, but the people who are now at the top of, of uh, 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 the IDF, they tend to think about it as, as a very far history which uh, uh, they are, are not responsible for. So they, they are just looking at the very last measurements. And uh, uh, we uh, were uh, invited several times to try and explain to them uh, why is this uh, uh, going on? And because at the beginning, they thought that the 82, 81% were, you know, just like uh, an accident for them and it took for them uh, a long time to understand what is happening there. And what is happening is this, and this is a very, very critical point for you to, to see that the trust in the IDF amongst the youngest age cohort is uh, significantly lower than amongst the, the older age cohorts. And, and, and this is the future. This is the people who uh, either serve now in the army or just serve, finish their military service or have friends uh, who serve in the army. Who are going to reserves, doing reserve of service. Reserves. Very few uh, actually <laughs> <laughs> serve in the reserve, but still it's, it's, uh, uh, it's an approach of a generation to the very fact that the IDF is uh, something that we should all rally around it, this flag. And uh, it's very difficult for the army to, to really accept this notion. And they started measuring uh, this by themselves. And uh, fortunately enough, they got worse uh, results than we got. So it's not, uh, it's not your fault, in other words. They don't publish the data, of course, but uh, uh, their sociologists and psychologists are uh, uh, in touch with us uh, very often because they are they go between us and 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 the chief commanders of the, of the army. But and when so, they so, Tamar, say, what's okay, what's going on other than the sort of generational the older generation has nostalgia for better days? And why is the why are the younger generation? Uh, uh, turning away. Uh, the older generations are still under uh, the impression that the IDF is the only institution that brings us all together. Whereas the younger age courts, uh, uh, they uh, started to be socialized uh, into politics or political thinking or uh, any, any uh, of this kind of thinking about the collective. 
uh, they do not have this uh, image of the army as a unifying factor, particularly is only about 50% are being mobilized. Whereas in the past, uh, we had much higher percentage of people serving in the army. So, so just uh, come on, to, to stop on this point, so just so people understand. So in the People's Army with mandatory service, where at least the ideal is that everyone serve, currently less than 50% of the population uh, serves. Because the army doesn't take them. I mean, it's it's a change in the army policy. It is not that people are uh, using whatever excuses to do that. The, just the army is taking only people with certain level of education, a medical situation, psychological situation, and 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 you name it. Uh, no, the two, the two, the two major, yeah. the two, ma the two major, the major the factor. Now, the major factor that uh, leads to this uh, less than 50% uh, uh, subscription uh, uh, outcome are the two major populations that do not serve, the Arab population that uh, uh, is exempt from service, and uh, it's a 20 something percent of our 18 year olds, and the ultra Orthodox population that all the attempts to, uh, uh, to uh, recruit it to the military by and large failed, and it's a growing, the growing uh, demographic vector of the ultra-Orthodox community means uh, that we end up with uh, almost 50% of our youngsters. The numbers add up because uh, religious women also do not serve and additional groups that Tamar mentioned, but in those other groups, there isn't a major uh, growth. As, as a matter of fact, the decline, I mean, in, in those who do not serve for health reasons and so on. But uh, uh, Jesse, those figures are, a or an indication of a huge challenge for, for the IDF and for the Israeli state. It's the, the decline actually is not that dramatic. It's from around 90 to around 80%. Uh, and, 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 and we think that the 80 is the new equilibrium of, of levels of trust of the Israeli public. But when we ask the public uh, and it reflects also that there's a high level of trust in the IDF, uh, in the IDF's operational ability to provide security. And therefore the number is actually relatively high. But when we ask what, how do you trust the IDF in it, its uh, financial conduct, economic conduct, how do you trust the IDF to deal with the uh, um, um, uh, individual needs of individual soldiers, sort of, when you ask about the civilian aspects and dimensions of the IDF conduct, we see numbers that are much uh, lower. And, and the figure that I find the most uh, uh, troubling and challenging is uh, when we ask Israelis, do you think Israel uh, should move to what's called in America an AVF model, an all volunteer force, or what we call a professional army, which means <coughs> only those who want to sign up as a, a as a profession, as a job, as a- but, you know, Like in the US. Like in the US, then for the first time, there's a dramatic increase in, in, in the support for that model. And for the first time, and I'm sure it would, some of our, of, uh, of our participants here would find it as a surprising piece of data. For the first time, a majority of Israelis support the moving to a model, to a professional uh, uh, service model and this majority increases the lower the ages. So young Israelis uh, particularly <coughs> support that transition. Now, what is the secret source of, the, of, of Israel's security? Now I'm obviously voicing my opinion, but it, based on decades of experience, both in the policy world and in serving in the military, I actually still serve also in reserves. Obviously it's our HR, it's our personnel, it's the quality, it's the commitment, and, and, uh, and because of a number of trends that we won't be able to analyze uh, right now in this short conversation, there's a major uh, a threat that what we were able to count on, which is that the smartest, brightest Israelis were extremely committed uh, to serve in the IDF, in, in combat units, in technological units, and to provide the, uh, uh, the outcome and the quality that is necessary in order to protect Israel. This cannot be taken for granted going forward. There's a need for, to adjust our model of service, the model of service for the standing army, for the uh, reserve army, 
for the officer corps and, and for alternatives of service. All of this needs to be um, a rethought because current, if we current trends and if we continue with business as usual, um, uh, uh, things are uh, not looking very uh, optimistic, the current trends. And, and this is something that we're deeply engaged in also at IDI and work with also uh, with the military, Tamar mentioned all of the top brass of the military uh, and in other, other parts, it's not only a mission, an issue of the idea. Uh, this, is, this is a major issue with profound implications for Israel's security going forward. I, I mean- this And society like, as a matter of fact. Yeah, we, we, we may want to devote a future session just to that to cover all of that. Well, um, I do want to pivot um, quickly to the issue of um, the tensions and divisions within Israeli society, and then we'll, we'll, we'll um, open it up to questions. So please do utilize the chat function to, um, to ask questions now or in, in, in the coming minutes. Uh, Tamara, can you put, take that away quickly? Because I haven't yet revealed the poll, okay. okay. Um, so, uh, so, I mean, we all know Israel's a, a deeply divided society. That's no secret. Um, this has also been a, a very divisive year on, on so many fronts, uh, fronts, whether it's the um, uh, all the partisan fighting over the course of four elections in, in two years, the, um, the tensions over COVID in the, in the Haredi community, the, of course, the violence between Jews and Arabs in, 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 in May. Um, so what is now perceived to be the greatest uh, divide within Israeli society. So we asked you at the beginning of this uh, webinar what your thoughts are. And of course, our sample size here is a little bit smaller than Tamar Herman's was in the survey. But uh, uh, Tamar Friedman, if you could share the results of our um, survey now. We'll... Okay, so with a sample size of eight, we have uh, tied for first place the, divide, the tension between left and right and between religious and secular. Um, and Tamara, now you, why don't you tell us what the, uh, the population of Israel thinks on this question? Okay, so, uh, well, the picture is, is uh, a bit different, but last year it was uh, uh, much more uh, accurate. Uh, I mean, your poll and, and our poll. So what we see is that uh, uh, in 2021, there was a, a very uh, large increase in uh, the percentage of those who pointed to the uh, Jewish Arab cleavage as the main cleavage or the main uh, uh, tension in Israeli society. Indeed, since 2012 to 2020, what we saw was a constant increase in the numbers of those who pointed to uh, the left and right uh, division. But this year, following uh, uh, the May events and the clashes between Jews and Arabs, uh, particularly in mixed cities, um, we saw a, an increase uh, in the number, again, in the number of those who pointed to the Jewish Arab uh, uh, cleavage as the most uh, uh, visible one. And uh, the question is, are we back to uh, former years like uh, uh, 2016, 2015, and so on and so forth? Or was it under the impact of the events uh, of May, after which, as we all know, uh, for the first time ever, we have an Arab party in the coalition, in the government, and, uh, and this was a, a very positive uh, development in the eyes of uh, uh, many in Israel, both Arabs and certain uh, uh, segments of the Jewish population. And therefore, we are actually very uh, uh, curious to see what would be the results uh, next year. Hopefully, we will not have a background like we had this year with the violence uh, 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 Tamar, just to clarify, this, this poll was done in June, so pretty much a month after the May event. So yeah. It could be that Absolutely. there's a big, a big effect of the uh, of that. But uh -huh. as you say, that the fact that um, you know this, this horrific violence in May, not surprisingly, causes this reaction in public opinion. But then you have this first ever Jewish Arab coalition. Um, in, in the midst of all all this mistrust, uh, Yochanan, how do you 
explain the formation of the uh, of the coalition uh, in the wake of the May events, and and is it really durable? Uh, you know, we're talking six well, or this, seven months in now. This uh, uh, new coalition or this uh, feature of the coalition of a, of a Jewish uh, Arab uh, collaboration at the coalition level is uh, is the first time in Israel's history. Is 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 as awkward as it sounds, because we had the Arab members uh, in Israeli Knesset for, uh, since the foundation of the state, and obviously Arab members in, in, in Zionist parties, they were part of coalitions, but Arab parties or parties that were uh, largely representing only the Arab minority with the, the, the Arab members, they were never part of the coalition. And, and this happened immediately after May, and, 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 and it's a, it's a hugely consequential experiment because if this experiment succeeds in the sense that it will normalize and legitimize this practice of Arab parties joining a coalition, it will completely transform Israeli politics and, and, and the equations of power in Israeli politics. So far, without the participation in, coalition, in coalitions of the Arab parties, uh, there, was, there was no real option of forming a coalition without the ultra-Orthodox parties, unless it's a national unity between, right, uh, uh, between the center left and the right. And, and, and this opens up uh, uh, new avenues and, and new options. Uh, and of course, it, it opens up a horizon also of, of, a, of a better representation for the Arab minority and its uh, tangible needs. So uh, Mansour Abbas, the leader of Ram, not a very... Um, uh, he, he, not, not the leader that you would expect for such a transformative decision, not very eloquent and so on, but he, he did it as, as opposed to, uh, to say, Ayman Ode, the leader of Khadash, who came with a very fresh new rhetoric as he entered into politics back in 2013. But at the end of the day, he was um, uh, 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 very loyal to his own constituency and, and, and didn't, wasn't able to match his rhetoric uh, with the uh, uh, with the uh, political decisions now um, this uh, uh, now we're seven months into this government so we can ask ourselves you know what's the state of this experiment is it succeeding or not uh, and 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 the jury is still out the jury is out what we're uh, what we're seeing is on the one hand a government that made the decision in the last budget of a dramatic 30 billion allocation, 30 billion shekel allocation for economic development uh, uh, in, uh, within the Arab minority. We were very involved in shaping the, uh, the details of, uh, of, uh, of various aspects of this decision because it required many uh, policy decisions and policy preferences and policy uh, remedies and solutions. So we were very much in the details of, of, of helping shape the details of that decision. But uh, so that was one major decision. The other, which uh, directly was a direct outcome of the May events also, is the government focus on, 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 on uh, confronting crime uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the Arab sector. And uh, so it's clearly a government priority. And, uh, but, but we still, you know, we, we, the, the, the scorecard is out and we still, I cannot say that the government was effectively able to deal with that uh, uh, challenge of crime. As a matter of fact, today, the top ranking police officer, uh, Arab uh, police officer, who's supposed to lead the battle against crime in the Arab sector is resigning as a result of a misconduct in a, in a, in a scene, in a, in a crime scene. So, and, and, and what's probably interesting uh, to note we we'll end with that again because this can also be a subject of an entire discussion. Is the uh, 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 I would say almost violent rhetoric crack, uh, clash between the Ram uh, members led by Mansour Abbas and those who remained in opposition, the joint list led by Ahmad Tibi and uh, Ayman Ode, who are constantly bashing Mansour Abbas for supposedly compromising with a Zionist and so on and not achieving enough. So whatever he achieves is, is labeled as not enough and insufficient and so on. And there's constant pressure on Mansour Abbas, especially because he, he voiced some very pragmatic uh, 
opinions, also accepting Israel's character as a Jewish and democratic state. So he's uh, receiving a lot of heat and it's, it's unclear uh, and, 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 and because for the joint list, it's also a matter of survival. If Mansour Abbas uh, is perceived in the Arab minor, uh, community as somebody who delivered the goods, they will lose out. So it's a, it's a zero sum game between those two uh, uh, opponents and, uh, and it's, it's an issue that is still uh, unraveling. So Tamar, the Arab left are not the only ones who are unhappy about this new uh, era of partnership between Jews and Arabs. What are the, some, of the, some, some of the Jewish population think about this and how has it affected your polling on you know, the questions of the balance between Jewish and democratic and so on? Well, I, of course, uh, uh, it has become like everything as a, a political issue in the sense of self-identification. Uh, people at the center and on the left, uh, Jews on the center and the left were very uh, happy with this development because they saw it, as Yohanan said, as the precedent for the, for the, pu for the future, but almost everyone, including uh, voters of Yamina, Bennett's party, Prime Minister Bennett's party, were very unhappy uh, with that. So it, unlike many other issues, it's not coalition versus opposition here, but uh, uh, more uh, uh, but around the, the, the political blocks uh, uh, issue. And uh, while uh, Yohanan was, was talking, I asked myself, what would have happened if uh, Netanyahu was the one to bring, uh, uh, to bring Abbas uh, on board? Uh, Which he was would... working to do. So there was a... yeah, yeah, it's not a theoretical question, obviously. Although now it demands it. It was yeah. almost uh, 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 reality. a reality. And then I wondered, how would the cards uh, 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 would be played uh, uh, if, if this would have happened? What would but the, have Tamar, happened? perhaps uh, the, the, the dramatic, the, the, the significant rise in the figure of support among Jews, the disconcerting figure, I might say, in my, in my view of Jews that support uh, granting uh, excessive rights to Jews versus Arabs in Israel, perhaps this figure has to do uh, with uh, discontent that Israelis feel to, to the role, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the role of uh, Mansour Abbas and, 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 and the fact that he, he, he has a role in decision-making at the governmental level, is that? Would you... Absolutely, you can see the data here. Uh, we uh, presented uh, uh, several times in the past, but in our latest uh, October poll, as well, uh, the following statement, Jewish citizens of Israel should have greater rights than non-Jewish citizens. And uh, intentionally, we didn't put Arabs there because otherwise the results would have been even more uh, problematic from the, the democratic point of view. And actually since uh, 2018, you can see a, a constant increase in the numbers of those who say, that uh, a Jewish citizen should have uh, more rights. And this but, is- But can I be a devil's advocate as a clarification question on, on, the, on the phrasing of this question? I mean, if I, if I would, I can uh, assume that say the right of return is, uh, is a greater right that a Jew enjoys in the country versus an Arab. And therefore I would answer this question in the positive because I support the right of the law of return. Uh, so do you think it's, you know? Well, uh, uh, to start with, we asked about Jewish citizens and not, uh, it, not in a collective uh, uh, manner, like not the Jewish uh, sector versus the, the non-Jewish sector. Sec second, uh, maybe you belong to one of the people here. <laughs> uh, no, because, no, I, I try to clarify because <laughs> the, the, a, a very basic, obviously, democratic notion is that civil rights among citizens should be, you know, equal. And, uh, and as long as there are no ways to explain away why people answered what they answered, it demonstrates that we have a huge uh, democratic uh, uh, challenge to deal with. Uh, half of the Jewish population thinks that Jews should have uh, uh, superior rights. So that's, I was just trying to 
better diagnose uh, 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 the scope and whether there is a challenge in the scope of it. I wish you were right because uh, we are going to publish in, uh, in a month or two uh, our uh, research uh, on, on Jews and Arabs in Israel, this specific uh, uh, research project. And if you see the number of those saying, don't let the Arabs buy lands in Israel and don't let them do this and don't let them do that, then uh, I suppose that they weren't thinking on the level of the right of return or, or what have you. Uh, it sounds like the makings of yet another webinar. So um, <laughs> we are, um, this is the last 10 minutes of our time. So we'll move to some questions. Um, Let's do this pretty quickly if we can, just sort of a quick ping pong on some other issues that really okay. have come up so far. So one, one quick question that pertains to the NSO crisis, which was in the New York Times article recently, obviously a lot of controversy, um, but usually what we hear about is the use of this Pegasus software by, by dictators to repress dissidents and, uh, and, and journalists. Uh, but there's an Israeli angle too, I understand. So what, what's, um, um, how has it come up in, in, in the Israeli context the police potentially using it against Israeli citizens, and what 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 do we know about Israeli how the Israeli public has reacted to these revelations? Well, apparently the the Israeli police purchased this NSO software a few years ago and began to use it. They claim by getting permission from judges and to use it only in specific ways in order to deal with the severe crimes and so on. But allegedly, they did it in a more. Uh, they used it in a in a in a broader uh, way, also against uh, uh, to track protesters that uh, protested against Mr. Netanyahu in the past two years. So obviously, it, it, this uh, tool that was uh, intended to be used against Israeli enemies and later on exported, and now it's being used against Israeli citizens. It it, it um, uh, opens up uh, uh, a, a, an entire, I would say, box area subject, which is the, there's a new technologies and Israeli privacy legislation needs to be adjusted. And the whole processes and supervision, we want the police to be strong. We want the police to have the best technology to fight organized crime and to fight against killers. But we want to protect our rights. We want to protect our democracy. We want to protect uh, uh, those who want to uh, protest and so on. So there's much uh, uh, that needs to be uh, 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 reorganized here. We are strongly involved in this area and trying to help now the state clearly needs to devise uh, uh, new ways, new procedures, new institutions, how to deal with those uh, new technological changes. Tamar, the Israeli public has worked up about this as Yohanan is, or they, they're saying, let the police do its work. They trust the police. We don't even um, trust them. Of course, there is the correlation between the distrust uh, of the police and the uh, uh, the news about uh, uh, the new techniques that the uh, police uh, um, used. In particular, that uh, they see not only the police as responsible, but also the judges. Uh, they think that uh, the judges are uh, too easy on the police in getting them uh, permission to, to use that. But uh, uh, we asked them specifically about uh, 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 for which purposes uh, are they ready to uh, or, or give or legitimize uh, the usage of these techniques. So for uh, security issues, it was over 80 something percent. Yes, of course. Uh, and and, and, and uh, uh, other issues uh, as well, pedophiles and whatever. The only uh, uh, good uh, or, or hopeful uh, uh, result was that uh, only a minority agreed to use these uh, techniques in order to follow uh, anti-government activists. Mm -hmm. So on this issue, uh, uh, democracy actually uh, won. Uh, and and, and I, I, I was very uh, positively surprised that uh, this was uh, uh, 
as low as that because I thought that maybe not 80 something percent is on, on, on other issues, crime and, and security and uh, uh, pedophilia, but I thought it might be half, uh, 50 percent, maybe 60 percent. And when I saw that it was well below that, I thought that maybe we have a stronger uh, democratic, you know, uh, commitment then right. we tend uh, to see uh, in, in our surveys course, on other issues. There's a huge practical difficulty with differentiating between the purely security and the purely political, but uh, we'll leave that for another discussion. Quick question for you, Yochanan. Who comes after Naftali Bennett? We know that according to the rotation agreement, uh, Lapid is scheduled to take over in mid-2023. Is that going to happen? Is Netanyahu going to stage a comeback? Is someone else? What's what? Oh, well, Mr. Netanyahu is still a, a strong factor in Israeli politics. I wouldn't write him off unless, obviously, he accepts a plea deal and uh, uh, that will remove him from uh, any public position for more than seven years. Otherwise, he's still a strong factor, although we saw that he, for four election campaigns, he wasn't able to win enough votes in order to form a government. So he's a factor. But I wouldn't assume that he would become a next prime minister. If Netanyahu pulls out, there will be a, a, a struggle within the Likud. And whoever leads the Likud uh, uh, might form an alternative government within the current uh, uh, Knesset. That's one option. Uh, but again, none, none of the existing members of the government have uh, any this particular desire to uh, uh, provide their seats and. Uh, 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 to any Likud members in opposition. So perhaps they'll try to lure other Likud members who lost. So if Netanyahu pulls out of the game as a result of a plea deal, uh, we're entering a sort of a, uh, a period of, a, of a political uh, uncertainty and realignment. If Netanyahu stays, we're, we're, continue, we're in a continuation of a situation of political uncertainty because uh, it will still be unclear whether the political crisis is over or it's just a ceasefire before continuation. So in both cases, we are uh, guaranteed to uh, continue the period of uncertainty, so it won't be boring. So perhaps also for the political prospects, we will have to dedicate a separate discussion. So we've got two minutes left. Tamara, I guess you'll, uh, uh, you'll interrupt me if we have to end. But the last question here pertains to the uh, potential uh, return to the Iran nuclear deal. Obviously, both governments and, and Israel-U.S. relations, both governments and Israel and the U.S. are sort of re strong reactions to their predecessors. Bennett, the reaction to Netanyahu. Biden, the reaction to Trump. Um, Biden, obviously, heading back towards uh, potential uh, uh, resumption of the nuclear deal. Um, there's been some controversy about that it's in Israel and some um, people have been speaking out from the security establishment. Tamara, is there any sort of shift in public opinion on this issue? Uh, uh, what, what do the Israelis think about all this? Well, basically, I think that the Israelis uh, were not so convinced that it's an immediate danger. Okay, uh, for years now, we see that Netanyahu and other people around him, and uh, in a way, the IDF. Uh, uh, very uh, top uh, officers are, are talking endlessly about the Iranian uh, threat. But somehow Israelis are more concerned with the here and now, and they see it like uh, something which is uh, a bit remote. So uh, in, in a couple of months ago, we asked about should Israel uh, uh, attack Iran without American consent. And here again, we saw the political rift between the left, center, and right. Left and center say, no, no, no. Whereas the right say, OK, we can go uh, without American uh, consent. And, and it's amazing because this issue should not be uh, in a way, I mean, uh, someone from from the moon or from Mars, uh, uh, if if they land here uh, and they look at these issues, they would be very surprised to see that everything, everything goes by uh, Israelis' uh, political self position. Yeah, and uh, I think uh, our, our American I'm viewers will not be surprised to hear that. You know that. Uh, in an era where, where, where whether to wear a mask or not is politicized and uh, everything is politicized. Yeah. So I think we need to end here. And it's good that you have this slide up about being proud to be an Israeli. I mean, there has been a slight dip 
but uh, we see overall uh, very high levels, at least to the Jewish public. But I have to say, in pertains to the Arab public, when you ask them, would you, if you were given a handed a second passport and, and offered to emigrate and live in a different country, would you choose to do do so? We have, you know, sizable majorities in both communities that that, that want to that they call Israel home and are and are happy to stay there. And I think that's good, despite all the turbulence and, and, and upheavals of the past year. So, regardless of all the challenges, the state of the republic is strong. <laughs> That's a that's a good last statement to end with. That's very positive and feeling strong with even all that we dived into today. So thank you, um, Jesse and Yochanan and Tamar, for this this a very interesting presentation and for sharing sharing this data with us and for your continued partnership to bringing this type of briefings and information to our membership um, here at JFN. And we will continue to do this every few months, um, come together to really um, dive deep into information. So, so thank you um, for, our, for your time and for sharing your wisdom. And thank you for everybody that participated. And stay tuned for, for future programs together um, where we can come together and learn again. Thank you all. Have a great day and, and stay well. <laughs>